we were to have such a notion of responsible sovereignty, we would have to, of course, rethink and recalculate uh, our national interest. Because together with the idea of responsible sovereignty would uh, probably come the acceptance of the fact that if I, as a politician, want to go to international conferences and get a good deal so that I can proudly go home and tell my voters, you know, you know, as a result of this international cooperation, your welfare will be enhanced, we will be better off. Every politician wants to do that. You know, they cannot go home and say, I was a fool, they pulled me across the table. It's not possible. You know? So either they don't get involved in anything or they want to have a positive uh, outcome. But if I want to do it, then I have to grant also the fact that every other delegation coming to an international um, uh, 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 conference would like to go home and say, I got something positive for us. There must be, as Hazel also underlined, there must be win-win deals. Now, we have done also um, everything that I'm proposing. We have uh, tried to figure out in detail. We have done um, studies on what it costs us uh, not to act on problems and what it costs to take corrective action in a timely way, like on financial crisis or uh, climate change or so. And these studies show that inaction is up to 400 times more expensive than taking corrective action. It also shows that in the first time around, many international bargains produce winners that have such big wins, you know, that they could easily pay off the others so that everybody could go home with a, a, a positive outcome and, and feel engaged and feel like actually it's worth following up and doing something. Today we have these forced agreements, often if we have them at all, but since people didn't have a voice, you know, they feel, you know, I go home, I don't do anything. And as a result, we let uh, problems drag on and uh, get worse. So we have to undertake cost-benefit analysis that take into account that we want to achieve win-wins. And we will find out that in most instances, we would still win, whoever we are. Or if we don't win, then we at least know how much we have to ask for in order um, uh, to achieve win-win. So, but how does uh, uh, such win-win come about? Should we drop generously groups from the bargaining tables? No. My third uh, proposal is, if it is correct that nation states are basically private actors, you know, when they appear internationally and go for their national advantage and also want to be treated uh, fairly, then we really have to look at international uh, negotiations as a political market. It's a market. And states at the national level have this uh, sort of uh, uh, harmonizing role very often. But when they are internationally, they are shrewd national actors pursuing particular interests, and therefore international negotiations have nothing in common with the policy-making process nationally. They are a political market. Interestingly enough, if you watch international negotiations, they have all the characteristics that we do not permit anymore in national markets. You have monopole or oligopole, the North Atlantic Alliance, you know, ramming everything through in most instances, except for Copenhagen. We don't like oligopoles in economic markets, but we tolerate them uh, in, um, in political markets. Some delegations in Copenhagen had 1,500 members, others had three uh, information asymmetries. When it comes to my favorite global public goods, free riding, you know, let others pay, I wait. You know. So we really, I, I would think we would gain a lot if we were to give up the notion that governments are the same when they appear internationally. No, they are private actors and we have to analyze their behavior through the lens of uh, markets rather than uh, uh, states. So we want an efficient market, political market. How do we get it? By giving, preferably, everybody an effective voice so that they can fend for themselves. You know? And again, changes in this direction are underway. From the G8, we move to the G20, 
And even now we feel that maybe the G20 is, has to be rethought, has to be, uh, has to have re rotating, rotating membership maybe, so that everybody is better uh, represented. Voice reform in the Bretton Woods institutions, so changes also in this direction are underway. But we need more democracy um, at the international uh, level. In order to know when do I gain, when do I lose, from whom could I ask for compensation, like Africa in the case of climate change, we have to stop negotiating things like climate change or poverty reduction, things that are too big to understand. And we have to break it down, good by good, global public good by global public good, and therefore we actually introduce the concept of global public goods. because. We have to do to public policy concerns, we have to give them the same favor that we give private goods. I have never seen, let's say, Boeing air company, airplane company, uh, sit there in their board and say, ah, oh, if we only had a dreamliner, wouldn't that be nice? You know? But in the UN, we sit and say, oh, let's reduce poverty. Yeah? And then nothing happens. So we thought uh, by introducing the notion of a global public good, we would say, hey, you know, goods have a production path. You have to think through how you get to the goods. So let's think what the inputs are, who has to provide them, when, and all of that. So we have a lot of discussion on the production path of um, global public goods. Again, reality is very clever and way ahead of us, I would argue, because what you see is a lot of Issue, single issue specific international cooperation mechanisms. The Global Health Fund, the Global Environmental Facility, biodiversity mechanisms, so many things, uh, very issue specific because there we can work out the incentive structures, know better how to involve also private actors. So my plea would be foster and recommendation foster this issue specificity. Don't try to kill it as many people who are coming out of the aid community try to do. Because the aid community is used to country-to-country -country relations, but the new world requires to focus on issues, not only countries. We have to deal with issues. So my last recommendation is, uh, as you can gather, all of this requires a new diplomacy. Why this? Because in this interdependent world, where we want to actually get to problems being resolved, lest the bad things continue uh, to travel. We need to achieve results. We need to have, fec have effective uh, cooperation. We need commitment from all sides. We need win-win thinking, which diplomats traditionally do not bring along. They are thinking in you know, either leaning back, maximizing in the short run a national advantage, bombing uh, uh, countries, but you can't bomb HIV AIDS out of the world, you can't bomb financial stability into the world. These power politics will continue to remain important, but we have to learn that in certain areas our national advantage will be enhanced through cooperation and striving for mutual benefit. That rethinking has to be instilled into the next generation of uh, diplomats. I don't know whether the older ones will still be able to turn themselves around. So in uh, uh, conclusion, I s uh, think what we see from all of this is that a new policy domain has emerged, a domain of global public policy that cuts across national borders and where we have to have complementary uh, uh, policy inputs at the national level and at the international level, we have to think through the whole production cycle of the global public good. What do we have to do nationally? What internationally? And 95% of all inputs to global public goods are happening at the national level because you have to strengthen health systems nationally to kill diseases, you have to uh, 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 strengthen financial supervisory authorities nationally in order to uh, foster financial stability.